Mount Meru, Sun, the moon, the four continents. As I have said uh, the other day, it's not to clear our thoughts saying this prayer. In order to make this session of Dhamma's discourse a meaningful and fruitful one, we are going to see that the uh, verse of taking refuge and bodhicitta and we're, take, we're taking refuge in the three jewels until we become enlightened, which means take, uh, particularly within, within the context of the Mahayana, to, uh, in order to in, uh, attain full enlightened Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. Please think this over and say this prayer of ye be so nam ke do la pen je san ye do ba ra shu ye che da so ye cho nam ai to the buddha dharma and supreme assembly i take refuge until enlightenment is attained through the collections of merit and wisdom by listening to the teaching may i become a buddha to benefit all sentient beings so say this three times I get on the music, the one that I make and on the road when you don't know what I'm saying. Get what I get, church and door. Can't get two seniors on there. Don't want to get one bit of ambition. It is a quantum dollar. Prostration to the Buddha, <coughs> who out of his compassion, moved by his compassion toward the holy town to read us off all the distorted views. And it's a good thing. So the Buddha, who was skillful and compassionate, since he appeared in India, it's been around 2,600 years now, according to the uh, uh, Theravada school. So during this time, it has become a very important religion in the world. The Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, is recognized uh, in the world as an important founding teacher um, uh, who is uh, the, the teacher of nonviolence as well. So today, 
when it comes to people using their intellect, uh, intelligence to analyze things, investigate, and not just accept right away what they hear. Such people find the Buddhism to be, to take special interest in Buddhism, and therefore this teaching of the Buddha People who are gathered here today, Tibetans and Himalayan people from the Himalayan regions, and also Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, and similarly from people from Burma, Thailand, Sri Lanka, if there are anybody from these countries also, and uh, we also have Mongolians, inner and outer Mongolians, as well as the Mongolian, ethnic Mongolians uh, from Buryat, Kalmyk, and Tuva regions of the Russian Federation. So for us, Buddhism is our traditional religion. So, of course, it's not good uh, right to uh, attach, to be attached to one's, uh, to have attachment to one's own uh, religious tradition. So, in, of course, we are following our traditional religion, but being attached to one's own religion becomes, makes us rather biased bear some kind of a biased attitude. Anyway, we have this traditional religion. In any case, it is, it helps, this tradition helps us to have peace of mind. So, in da our daily life, and particularly when we face problems, this tradition is something which brings a real uh, peace of mind. Even non-Buddhists these days take interest in the teaching of the Buddha. So for peace of mind, peace and happiness in family, individual family and community, love and compassion, patience and so forth are important. And so old religious traditions teach love and compassion. And in order to practice this with uh, a conviction, there are the theistic religions which also are meant for that. The greater your faith and devotion to the uh, God you believe in, and you, you, the greater, more stronger your uh, practice of love and compassion should be. So in order for that purpose to, to cultivate single-pointed to cultivate love and compassion and the, uh, the, the different philosophical ideas are also taught. So even if you may have some faith in the God or higher beings that you believe in, if you do not really practice love and compassion and make it rather as kind of a side kind of a uh, uh, work, uh, it's not right. So in order to promote or the practice of uh, and development of love and compassion, there are the theistic religious ideas of creator God. And uh, on the other hand, we have the Buddhism, Sankhya, non-theistic Sankhya and Jainism uh, believing, uh, teaching the uh, law of causality. And therefore, law of causality in these three traditions are considered very important, which says that if you do something wrong to others, if, then you will have the negative consequences, whereas if you do something good to others, then um, you will accordingly have positive consequences. And therefore, all religious traditions teach this 
love and compassion. And since around 3,000 years, perhaps Sankhya's school of thought developed, and uh, within it there is the non-theistic Sankhya. And since uh, around 2,600 or 700, uh, 6, 000, 6, 000, 2,600 or 700 years ago, the Mahavira, um, who the founder of Jainism, appeared, and he emphasized especially nonviolence. We can see to, even today the practitioners of Jainism. They really. Uh, make the practice of nonviolence, not harming others, as the cr uh, core of their practice. And uh, we can see uh, and the, uh, that they do, uh, sometimes seem to be doing more than what we do in terms of this practice. And then Buddha, Buddha appeared after him, and the crux of the, the, the core of the Buddhism, Buddhist practice is that love, uh, practice of love and compassion, and in order to support that, then uh, the Buddha taught the view of dependent origination. So this is a unique teaching of the Buddha, the, the view of dependent origination. So during the last 2,600 years or so, the Buddha first in public gave whether people have, uh, faith, uh, have devoted to the Buddha or not, he taught the first sermon uh, he gave was the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. And that is like the big framework of the teaching. So this is the noble truth of suffering, noble truth of origin, uh, the noble truth of uh, true cessation, and the noble truth of the true path. So this teaches the nature of the four noble truths. So all of us do not want suffering, but we want happiness. But how do we experience how how do how does suffering come about so buddhism doesn't believe in a creator god who is the doer or designer of our peace and pain and pleasure nor do we believe in a permanent unchanging course to give rise to suffering but we believe or assert that causes and conditions bring about some result. And therefore the Buddha taught the first two noble truths, which are the uh, noble truth of suffering, the true suffering, and which is the result, and the true origin of suffering, which is the cause. And so, whether these pain, pain and pleasure arise from some permanent unchanging course or not, if you ask, no, they do not. And if you look at the cause, if they are produced by causes, for example, if we hurt somebody or harm somebody, the other person will be hurt or there is discomfort created in the other person. And you also feel guilty if you fight with the others or quarrel with others. So uh, mad people are different perhaps. So a normal person, if you have done something for a normal person, if you have done something wrong to others, I mean, you will not feel easy, at ease. And so harming others is something immoral or misbehavior. So this comes through unruly mind, undisciplined mind. The more you are undisciplined, the more it exhibits in your um, behavior. And if you are more disciplined, your actions will also tell. And so the, the, uh, the physical and uh, verbal actions are rooted in, in our mind motivation. And therefore the Buddha says, do not, not committing, do not committing, uh, commit any evil, cultivate the wealth of virtue and thoroughly, thoroughly subdue your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Now, in terms of subduing your mind, disciplining your mind, so if you have a very um, rough kind of a mind, um, 
You may be able to bring about some peaceful attitude within your mind stream, but in order to uproot all our faults, that's the biggest question, what should we do? So when we talk about the four characteristics of the, each of the four, uh, the uh, four noble truths, all composition, uh, composite phenomena are compounded phenomena are in the nature of suffering and uh, impermanence. And all contaminated, impure things are in the nature of suffering. And all phenomena are empty of self and uh, empty and selfless. So all our suffering, in other words, are rooted in our grasping at some independent self. But because things are self, without any self-identity, independent in existence and empty, as long as there is this ignorance which conceives independent existence and things, distorted uh, view, then there's always going to be a counteracting factor for that. So although things do appear to us as if they have some independent objective existence, this distorted view always has its uh, antidote. In the case of in the case of the climate or the weather, the uh, the if the heat rises, then the coldness is I mean, diminishes, and if uh, the coldness uh, 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 increases, automatically the heat decreases. So on the one hand, there is this distorted view which sees there is some kind of a self or independent existence, and on the other hand, the wisdom sees the lack of that independent existence. And so, since things are without any independent existence, the distorted view of self it can be eliminated. It is not within the intrinsic, the, the basic innate quality of the mind. So due to certain circumstances, we develop hate, uh, attachment, or ha uh, anger, and so forth. But uh, they do not stay uh, permanently in our mind, as we know. If you look at love and anger, they also are opposites. So they do not arise in a single uh, person, uh, within the mind stream of a person, at the same time, simultaneously. Sometimes you'll feel angry at somebody, at other times you have uh, um, attachment also. Or Therefore, these negative states of mind are not in uh, the innate quality of the mind, and that there is an uh, antidote to them, and that antidote has valid support of valid cognition, valid knowledge, whereas the other one, distorted view, which sees things to have some kind of a, uh, independent existence. But if you really think closely over and over again, then you'll see that things do not exist the way that distorted view uh, conceives. And therefore, if you eliminate this distorted view of self, then you'll be able to, there is a possibility to overcome it, and then the uh, elimination of it is the uh, liberation. And therefore, the Buddha taught the, four, the third and fourth noble truths, the uh, noble truth of true cessation and true suffering, a uh, true path, sorry. And therefore, the Buddha also taught four, I mean, gave, uh, stated four qualities or attributes of each of these four noble truths. 
And so, it's, uh, we should not leave the teachings, these kind of teachings on the Four Noble Truths and the 16 characteristics just in books, but try to think over, reflect on them. I do that in daily life. When I, ref when I recite uh, Om Arapachana, the mantra of uh, Manjushri, so this is like the basic framework of Buddhism, which the Buddha taught during the first sermon. And so that was about the nature, stating the nature of the Four Noble Truths. So if that is the case, how do we use it in our practice? avoiding some certain things and uh, uh, developing others. And therefore the Buddha said, uh, one should know suffering and overcome the origin of suffering and actualize the true cessation because we do not want suffering but happiness. And therefore if he, the, the, regarding this true cessation, what it means, it refers to is the elimination of any um, uh, amount of negative emotions or uh, those uh, defilements to be abandoned uh, through the antidote. And when you attain the purity or the uh, elimination of that, uh, the, you have cessation. And that has to be actualized and that is to be done by cultivating the path. So the Buddha says cultivate the path. And what is the, what is the purpose of that? The Buddha said, uh, having, having understood the, when you have eliminated the root of uh, the suffering and its causes, you have overcome uh, uh, you have overcome the origin, and therefore there's nothing to be understood or no, nothing to be known. And then regarding the, uh, the origin, there's nothing to be overcome once you have overcome it. And then once you have reached cessation, true cessation, there's nothing else more to, more to be uh, actualized. And uh, then uh, nothing also to be uh, uh, cultivated in terms of the path once you have crossed the path. So, of course, pain and pleasure come uh, alternately to us, and then we have all kinds of problems also. So once you have eliminated all suffering, then you have reached eternal happiness. And so that is the result which should come through by applying the teaching of the Four, the four Noble Truths avoiding the, the, the overcoming two and then uh, developing the other two. <coughs> so for example, there is this grasping at self and so overcoming this grasping at self, you reach the cessation through the path. And these are based on the understanding of the true truths. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the truth at the basis level. And when we look at the path, the Buddha says the cessation uh, should be actualized. So how to see that it's possible for us to reach the cessation and what actually causes the, uh, uh, leads to that cessation is taught more precisely and in detail in the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. So the origin of suffering, which is grasping itself, is a distorted view. And so it's an ignorance. And therefore, what it is ignorant about is the, how things really are, selflessness. So the Buddha, right from the beginning, if he had taught that there's no form, no sound, and so forth, I mean, people might have uh, thought that, oh, this, Buddha, this is a teacher who uh, teaches that nothing exists. 
but he led disciples rather in a gradual manner. So if there is some, if there are someone, I mean, if there are people who are interested in um, um, what, it, what is meant by this, then there are uh, the teachings of the, four, uh, the perfect and wisdom sutras to understand how things exist unlike how our distorted view perceives or conceives it. So those of you who are here for the teaching first time, who, are, who, have, who have not been to teachings like this before, please raise your hands. Among the monastics, anyone? So many of them are from Tibet, perhaps where the Chinese mm. audience those people who firstly come here uh, who never who never been who never listen to the Rosh raise hand so I don't see if you are down there outside <laughs> so you don't have to keep raising your hands <laughs> like soldiers <laughs> until they're told to keep your hands down, put your hands down. So I usually jokingly tell that the Heart Sutra is something that the Buddha taught in the Rajgriha, in the vulture. Uh, mountain amongst many different audience con uh, consisting of uh, gods and demic arts uh, um, the uh, non-gods humans so it, if you think about it it seems it was taught um, amongst uh, two people, uh, two beings who had uh, pure karma, as Jesus Miller Rebbe has said, when to his disciples, uh, his disciples were Dagbol Haji, Gambupa, and Rechungpa. So Rechungpa was quite a tough student sometimes. So when he had been to India one, uh, one or two times, and uh, after the, one of these, so he, he had brought certain texts which, were, which belonged to the non-Buddhist tantric uh, texts. And Jyotun Milareba checked what kind of texts Rechungpa had brought from India. And when he, f uh, he found some of the texts to be uh, concerned, uh, related with uh, s uh, negative uh, spells. And Milarepa actually went, uh, burned those texts when uh, Rejungpa went out to fetch water for him. And Rejungpa, when he came back, he smelled some uh, smelled, uh, burnt um, peppers. So when he saw that the Milarepa had actually burned some of the texts, and so they had a, a quarrel, a conflict, a problem there. And so the Jungba was unhappy and revolted. And so at that point, Jesu Milarepa brought down hailstones and uh, and uh, Milarepa uh, then uh, Rejungpa felt concerned about where my master went. So, of course, he could, see when he was uh, Milarepa's student, and he could hear the voice of Jesus Milarepa, but he couldn't see him. And when he listened carefully, he found that it came from a horn. And when he looked into the horn, he saw Jesus Milarepa there. And when he looked at the horn, when he saw it, Jesus Milarepa, he found that the, the horn had not actually increased in size, and Milarepa had not decreased in size. And Milar Jizu, then um, Rechungpa tried to go inside. And so that, hap that this kind of thing could happen 
to Milarepa could do that when um, he, I mean, it was, it is possible, I mean, uh, when you are, you have gained full control over your energies and mind. And so, similarly, in the case of the Vulture Mountain, it had not in, um, become uh, bigger, nor the, the number of audience um, um, uh, shrank. But he was the Buddha himself at that time, during the uh, uh, teaching Heart Sutra, uh, was absorbed in this concentration called profound illumination. And then the Chariputra and Chandrasik, Avalokiteshwara, had discussion. The, regarding Avalokiteshwara, who was a deity form of a disciple, for someone who is not able to, who was not able to see Avalokiteshwara at all, but could see Chariputra saying something, might think that. Uh, might think that Shariputra was talking to himself. And so, this, this kind of case is possible. So, at such a time when the Buddha taught the, four, uh, the Perfect Hindu Wisdom Sutras, because it was not in public, it was not recorded, hist in, uh, uh, historically recorded. And therefore, there were people who say that this was not taught by the Buddha. And uh, even uh, people say that uh, these, uh, what the, these uh, sutras teach uh, is nihilism. And therefore, later on, many great scholars uh, have argued for Mahayana to be the teaching of the Buddha. So the Paramita, the Perfection of Wisdom teachings, actually emphasized on uh, emphasized the teaching of the uh, true cessation that was taught, firstly in uh, the uh, the Four Noble Truths teaching. And then there are other teachings. <laughs> Uh, like the uh, Tathagata Garbha Sutra and also Sandi Nimochana Sutra. So for those who were not receptive, who were not able to take literally the, what is taught, what was taught in the Perfection Wisdom Sutras, for, the, for their sake, the Buddha, regarding the teaching of the, which says well, there's no form, no uh, sound, no order and so forth, uh, the Buddha kind of interpreted uh, these teachings for uh, such people who were not receptive, um, saying that uh, he taught these in, in, with the three naturelessness in mind. Whereas the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, it's not the other sutra which is called Taktan Nyingbu Tempeto, which is uh, to say the essence being permanent and uh, s enduring, uh, which is another sutra. So the Tathagata Gabba Sutra, <laughs> uh, I mean, regarding the, the, these three t uh, turnings of the wheel of Dhamma, the first turning of the wheel established the ground, uh, the fr framework. And then the second turning uh, exp uh, explains more on the cessation which is emptiness. And the third turning of the wheel of the Dhamma, Tathagata Gabha Sutra teaches the path aspect, the subjective path of which meditates on uh, the emptiness. And this is to lay the foundation to uh, lead towards Tantra. In the Tantra, of course, in the three lower Tantras, they don't teach the subtle clear light. But in all four Tantras, Tantra sets, there is this a meditation on emptiness. Where we, when we do the sadhana practices, we say uh, everything dissolves into emptiness and from within the state of emptiness. And so highest yoga tantra teaches the subtle clear light mind and using it to meditate on emptiness. And so these teachings uh, of the highest yoga tantra were taught uh, to uh, disciples with the highest sort of uh, mental faculty. 
And so the sequence of these teachings are like going through the school system. So there is the junior and then the middle school. So the first you need to go through the uh, in, uh, junior school and then the middle school and then high school and so forth. In the Nalanda masters, the great scholars in with regard to the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, which are taught in the Pali tradition, and also the Vinaya, the monastic code of discipline, such as which teaches, uh, which, uh, which has the precepts such like how to wear the robes, wearing the lower robe in a round fashion, and, and then leading into the uh, Mahayana. <laughs> and so Vinaya, the concentration, practice of concentration and uh, are similar, the practice of morality and concentration <laughs> are shared in both the Sanskrit and Pali traditions. <laughs> In the first chapter of Abhisamaya Alamkara, uh, it is mentioned uh, that the, what, it, what the first chapter teaches is the ten uh, points, beginning with uh, the uh, bodhicitta. And then there are other t uh, practices such as kotrup and so forth, uh, practice of I mean, armor-like practice and so forth. And so the Four Noble Truths taught in the first teaching of the first uh, sermon, as well as the practice of morality taught in the Vinaya. And then you go into the, uh, in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, the uh, extensive path of the Bodhisattvas, as well as the emptiness, and then the six perfections and so forth are also taught. <laughs> so in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, what Buddha says is, I mean, uh, teaches emptiness on the basis of, I mean, uh, which are established on the form and so forth, and then how to go about with the path, and then the result, how you attain the result. And then, therefore, the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma, as I said yesterday, you need to establish emptiness or the, the lack of true existence, independent existence and things through reason. So because there is every chance for people to misunderstand the teaching of selflessness and misunderstandings and misconceptions could happen. And therefore, Master Nagarjuna and uh, <laughs> other masters, uh, like Nagarjuna wrote his six treatises of uh, uh, emptiness, on emptiness. And then as uh, exegetical texts commenting on the third turning of the wheel of Dharma, which is the uh, Tathagata Sutra and so forth, and he wrote the hymns, the, the collection of hymns. So of course, understanding the Four Noble Truths uh, in a rough fashion, you don't need uh, perhaps to understand, you don't need the Perfect Universal Sutras, but to understand the, the, the Four Noble Truths in greater precision and in greater detail, you need the Perfect Universal Sutras. And therefore, uh, Master uh, the Lord uh, Maitreya and Master Asanga and so forth uh, commented on the um, on the, uh, the explicit content, the, the, the implicit content of the Perfect of Wisdom Sutras, um, whereas Master Nagarjuna and his disciples and followers commented on the explicit uh, content of this Perfect of Wisdom Sutras. And then also the uh, Master Asanga and so forth emphasized the uh, pers uh, I mean, uh, Chitta Matra philosophy based on the Samdhi Nimochana Sutra 
In other words, the Nalanda masters have actually given, uh, written many texts uh, as compared to the Pali tradition uh, scriptures. Uh, the Sanskrit the, uh, scriptures are much more in number. And then there is the Tantra, and particularly uh, this, the highest yoga uh, Tantra uh, is based on the uh, teaching of clear light, the subjective clear light. But the Buddha Dharma declined at some point after the Buddha had passed away. <laughs> but gradually, from the Nalanda Institution, great masters like Nagarjuna and so forth appeared, and they, uh, Buddhism in general, and particularly the Sanskrit tradition, they uh, studied and commented. And in Tibet, Chisung Detsen, who is also known as the religious king, Tsangpal Hai Metok, um, although Tibet already had familial relationship with China since the, Song, since the time of Songtsen Gampo in the 7th century, with his mar uh, marriage to the two princesses of uh, China, Wen Xin Kongzhou and uh, the Brikuti from Nepal, and therefore the two uh, sacred statues also were brought uh, with them to Tibet. And so we already had, Tibetans already had, uh, from the 7th century, um, this uh, familiar relationship with China. But with regard to Buddhism, explained through reason and logic, the uh, Tibetan uh, emperor, Tisong Detsen, saw that this is the best tradition that we could Im uh, import to Tibet. And so he invited Shandarakshita, who was already in his 70s, when he was invited, given the invitation, and he uh, very kindly accepted the invitation and went to Tibet. So the Bodhisattva, great abbot Bodhisattva Shandarakshita was a great master. And so amongst his writings, there is something called Tatuv Samgraha Prakarana, which is about Tantra, and therefore it's very clear from this that he was a practitioner of Tantra. So he came to Tibet in the 8th century. <laughs> One time in Mongolia, when I went there, in a huge playground, I toured the short, concise Lamrim, the Song of Experience by Jet Kappa. And at the end, uh, I mean, when I mean, when I had finished one page and put it on the table, it was blown away by uh, the wind. So I told, asked people to actually uh, look where it was going, and so it. The, Finally, I got it back. This was the text uh, that I, uh, the, the, the text I was using was actually the one that I brought from Lhasa when I fled Tibet. So in Lhasa, there is this saying that on a high mountain hill, I mean, on a high hill, I went to offer incense offering, and uh, but my uh, scripture, my uh, prayer book, was blown away by the wind, and I don't know where it, uh, uh, the pages are. So, so regarding the Tibetan uh, history, the Tibetan king uh, Tisong Deltsen 
was someone, um, a visionary person who could actually see, um, have a very far-sighted vision. So the, he could have, of course, uh, invited the scholars and teachers from China itself. But because we have this saying, I mean, in accordance with the saying that we should go back to the source of the water, uh, the, the, the head of the water, uh, <laughs> and therefore the, the first some seven Tibetans were given the monastic uh, uh, ordination in order to test whether uh, Tibetans would be able to keep the Vinaya uh, vows or not. And it was successful. And in the beginning, when the Buddhism was being established uh, on the Tibetan soil at that time, there were lots of uh, opposition from humans as well as non-human sp spirits and so forth. And um, uh, what we are t talking about here is that uh, the, the teaching of the Buddha had gone through many ups and downs. And today, after Buddhism had spread and it was established in Tibet and it spread, it, we have kept the Nalanda tradition and particularly the teachings of epistemology. It seems we, the Tibetans, are the only ones who have preserved and promoted this tradition of the Nalanda, particularly and, uh, China, Japan, and so forth. We all, I mean, uh, all of the, them also follow the Nalanda tradition, the same tradition that we do follow. Tangsen Xuanzang, uh, perhaps. <laughs> His uh, uh, tradition, he was a uh, follower of the uh, Dharmapala, uh, Nalanda master Dharmapala. So even today, the Chinese uh, practitioners and scholars are quite familiar with the Sandi Nimochana Sutra. And Mula Madhyamaka Karika by Nagarjuna is also translated in um, Chinese, but it seems uh, the uh, Prasana Pada commentary by Chandrakirti is not there in Chinese translation. <laughs> And so uh, the reason why Chandra uh, Kirti has detailed explanation of the Purnapurna Bhadimaka Karika is because of um, the objection from Bhaviveka to Buddha Palita's commentary. And uh, Chandra Kirti goes over those criticisms and rejects or uh, refutes them. And so because of these kind of challenges, the things have become more clear. And so if we look at Buddha Palita commentary by Buddha Palita, it's very inspiring, but there's not elaborate explanation in it. Whereas if you read, if you, if you, you read Chandrakirti's Prasanapada, it's very detailed. <laughs> and also Dvaviveka's uh, uh, the commentary, uh, lamp, lamp of wisdom. It's very uh, detailed explanation. <laughs> so in these texts, um, when Tibetan masters commented on the Indian texts, we, uh, they usually treated the text in three um, outlines. The uh, rejecting or refuting others' positions, establishing one's own position, and then again doing a, a rebuttal of criticism of others. <laughs> so if you could study the, uh, these three texts uh, the, uh, together, we could, uh, we could see the details of where the challenges and the debates had gone. And the things, uh, points become very clear to you. So this Prasanapada is not translated in China, Chinese. 
And then next, uh, later on, came Master Atisha, who was from Vikramalishila. When he came to Tibet, Tibet was already in a de decline, I mean, uh, ha a degenerated uh, situation because uh, of the killing of Tirebachin because of some family, family problem or something. And then the uh, bloodline, uh, one uh, bloodline of the, the Tibetan ancestors, Tibetan emperors went to the two uh, upper uh, regions of Tibet. So during the time of those three uh, great emperors, they have done a, a great deal of common, uh, made a great contribution to the Buddha Dharma, but uh, Lama Yeshe went to, uh, to went in search for, of gold in order to off, make offerings to the Indian masters to invite uh, Master Adisha. And so Buddhism had also declined at that point. And Chang <laughs> gathered some gold and he went to the Karlo Gyebo, the king who had actually uh, arrested his uh, uh, uncle, Lama Yeshiwu, and imprisoned him. And therefore, as it is found in the Lamrim text, in the, the re relating the stories, Lama Yeshiwu was in prison. And he was already quite old and uh, very weak physically. And so when Chang Zhubu saw him, Chang Zhubu told him, Lama Yishu, I'm going to pay gold in ransom in order to release you. <laughs> but <laughs> so is just joking that he would bite the mic if it's too close to his mouth. So it's quite a sad so you told that don't lose your heart <coughs> I have found gold equal to the, uh, the the size of your body the height of your body but I am just left with a gold equal to your head so I'll find that soon and come back and release you and Halama Yeshu told Chang Jube, don't think of releasing me from the prison. I will not lo uh, live long now, but from life after life, we go through the, these, the, the process of age, birth, aging, sickness, and death. But dying for Dharma is meaningful, and therefore, for the sake of Tibetan people, I, if even if I have to give up my life for the purpose of inviting uh, Georgia Adisha, I have no uh, uh, regret. And so, when he heard it, Chang Jubu, of course, was a, a nephew. <laughs> so when he found Lama Yeshua's determination for the Tibetan people and the Buddha Dharma, he felt rejoiced and also sad. And so he cried a lot. So when he asked Nakto Lotzawa, um, uh, to go and invite the 
uh, the uh, uh, Georgia Adisha. Uh, he, t he told them while crying, and Nakto and others could not uh, decline that request, and therefore they went to India and uh, and issue with Halam issue with the uncle told Zhang Zhuwe that you should uh, make sure that Georgia comes to Tibet and you could you could oh, you should also relate my story that I have given uh, forsaken my life for the Dharma and Tibetan people relate this to Georgia so when the request came George Adisha said, "Your uh, Tibetan kings were uh, king was uh, Bodhisattva, and it's not right to decline the request of um, uh, Bodhisattvas." And so, Adisha was someone who was taken care of by Arya Tara, and so she prophesied that you would be able to serve the Buddha Dharma and. Uh, uh, beings uh, very well in Tibet, and particularly with the help of uh, the one uh, Upasaka, uh, layperson with a vow, the, the Dharma will be served well in Tibet. And therefore, in Thurling, <laughs> Changju Bu uh, told uh, Master Atisha, we are not in a hurry to receive profound, uh, uh, deep teachings uh, or very vast teachings, but please say, teach something which is going to be helpful for the Tibetans, and therefore, a short teaching. And therefore, Master Atisha wrote the Lamb for the Path to Enlightenment which is, of course uh, draws uh, uh, the practices from the different scriptures, but it was written in a form uh, which helps three types of beings. <laughs> so it is a teaching which could be practiced by a single person in one seating without mixing up or confusing the stages or the, the, the order and the number of practices and so forth, from be uh, called beginning with the, the initial practice, leading, culminating to uh, in the uh, highest uh, enlightenment. So someone with faith in the Dharma and understanding the Dharma, particularly uh, having studied the, uh, done the study of Prajaparamita, and in essence, the uh, essence of the teaching is uh, referred by this Heart Sutra mantra, leading one a practitioner how to go about uh, uh, in, uh, with the practice, progressing along the path of accumulation, preparation, seeing, meditation, and normal learning. And so, this text actually summarizes. So, unless you have a broader understanding of the whole um, range of path. I mean, just focusing on Lamri itself would not give you the f uh, complete idea. <laughs> so, of course, uh, I'm not going to read Lamrim Chemo, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment, but I have brought it down with me today. And so, when uh, one time in Tsang, uh, in, uh, in a monastery in Tsang um, region of Tibet, there was a long life offering, puja offering for me. So uh, at that time, this text was offered to me. So I consider this very sacred and precious for me. And so this is a text that I brought with me when I fled Tibet. So I'm not going to read the Lamrim Chemo, but it will be, uh, I'll just put it here. And so when you actually read the insight section, penetrative insight section of Lamrim Chemo, then you will see the, 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 uh, the uh, weight of uh, the, the teaching of Lamrim, the profundity. And as Nagarjuna says in Muramadimaka Karika, the Buddhas teach, give teachings on the basis of two truths, the conventional and the ult ultimate. And it is said that the Buddha's teachings are based on the, the understanding of the, the uh, dependent origination. 
And also in the Bhavana Karma, it says that the Buddha, all the teachings of the Buddha are either uh, proceeding towards or leading to or landing at the suchness. And so I usually tell that when you teach people, you should start with the insight section of Lamrim. If you're teaching Lamrim, uh, because when you understand the two truths, the conventional ultimate truth, uh, then you'll s understand that cessation is possible through the uh, cultivation of the path. And then you will have a strong um, uh, called, uh, faith in the Buddha uh, uh, Dharma. And uh, then, uh, of course, taking refuge makes sense when you say, I take refuge. I seek refuge in the Dhar Buddha Dharma and Sangha without really being able to move yourself through reason. I mean, it's uh, very difficult. <laughs> so understanding the f two noble truths on the basis of which if you um, teach the four noble truths, then it's going to be really meaningful. And so even someone who is not, uh, does not believe in the teaching I mean, will not be able to go against the teaching. As I have written at the end of the uh, 17 Nalanda Master's praise, by understanding the two truths, the ground reality, uh, and leading to into the full understanding of the four noble truths, May I uh, gain an understanding of the teaching of the Buddha? So it's important for us to understand the two truths. So the system of teaching Buddhism, beginning with the uh, colors and so forth, uh, the, in the collected topics, and then into the uh, my study of mind and so forth, leading into the higher studies of Buddhist philosophy, is a very good tradition that we have as in, in Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition. Therefore, it's very important for us to try to practice the, uh, the, the teaching after having studied all of them. Otherwise, having set for Geshe examination, instead of doing practice of the Dharma, <laughs> then what has become of us uh, uh, monks is that they seek dollars, uh, money, and go to America and so forth. And in Tibet, uh, inside Tibet, there are people, I have heard that uh, there are people who are called Cha Lama in Chinese, uh, false lamas, false teachers, who pretended to be teaching, um, ostensibly teaching uh, Dharma, were actually seeking money and sex. So, if you find someone who is able to teach the Dharma as a qualified teacher, as the qualifications are given, the ten qualifications given in uh, uh, Sutra Alamkara, then you should consider the person to be a qualified teacher, otherwise not. So you sh the disciples themselves, the Chinese, you, them, you yourself have to check those lamas, whether they are qualified or not. As Master Tsongkhapa mentions in Lamrim Chemo, in the section on relying on a guru, uh, the qualifications of, he goes through these three outlines, qualifications of the guru, and qualifications of the disciple, and how the disciple um, uh, seeks the guru. Um, uh, and relies on the guru. And Swakya Pandita says that um, people are very serious when it comes to checking the quality of gold and uh, uh, precious metals and precious uh, jewels and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to the Dharma, people jump to them, the conclusions right away, as if uh, a dog meets with uh, meat. 
Whereas in, I mean, in Tibetan society, there is this uh, custom that people do not uh, kind of uh, value the geishas and the learned people, but when someone has the name of a lama or reincarnate Tuku, then they uh, actually um, value them, although they don't have any knowledge. So far, I mean, we cannot stay where we were. We need to change. In samsara, we are bound by our self-cherishing attitude and our grasping at true independent existence of things. So we need to see where the drawbacks are in us, where the shortcomings are, and then move forward. So we should develop that. The, the, the principles of bodhicitta and the understanding of emptiness as <laughs> it's not enough for us to f uh, consider that we are following just customs by reciting mantras and so forth. If we cannot do anything about studying the Dharma and so forth, of course we, uh, there's nothing we could do. But we, if we can, we must study the Dharma. And so this is how we should go about with the Dharma, having studied them, to, add, to integrate them in our, within ourselves. And so within the Lamrim tradition, there are the three Lamrim um, lineages. Mengakpa, the instruction lineage, uh, Lamrim lineage, and then the scholarly lineage. And so there are eight great uh, Lamrim uh, texts which are taught for guidance. And together with it, the, we are here gathered to complete the uh, rest of the te text. I'm uh, left with 500 pages, which must be finished within 10 days. So I will try to finish. So last time in Shamar Lamrim, we stopped. <coughs> no. So we stopped at uh, cultivating the root of all pleasure and goodness, faith of confidence. But before that, we'll go through Namdu Lakshan, the liberation, liberation in the palm of your hands. We are on the 11th chapter. <laughs> uh, 11th day. Day 12. <laughs> 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 Page uh, 322, it says, Dr. Rinpoche told us we should adjust our motivation, uh, uh, motive. The great place sutra says the three realms are impermanent as autumn clouds, being die, uh, beings die and are born. It is like watching a play. Beings like run. Um, lives run like lightning flashes in the sky or rush on the sky. High mountain uh, waterfalls. In other words, the three realms of and so forth. And then the outline, thinking about what sort of happiness or suffering you will have in your next rebirth in either of the two types of migrations on page 322. <coughs> so here the contemplation on suffering of the upper realms will come later in the medium scope. I'll now discuss the suffering of lower realms. You'll surely die, but it is not certain when. After you die, you, your consciousness does not end. It must definitely take rebirth. There are only two places in which it can take birth, the upper and or lower realms. 
as there is the Kadamba saying, what have you, what you have done in the past, um, should be judged uh, from uh, your body. What kind of body you have, what you will uh, be in the uh, future, should be judged. Uh, what kind of um, uh, what kind of motivation and thinking you have now in this life. <coughs> Uh, you can assess inferentially to which of these two you will be going. So the comment was here and uh, made here. As as I have already said, we get divinations in our school made to, uh, uh, made to tell us where we will be reborn next, but these are unnecessary. Buddha has already pre predicted that we will go to the upper realm if we have been virtuous and to the lower realms if unvirtuous. <coughs> now from the Jataka tales speak, quite certain your birth to the next world will be happy or unhappy according to virtuous and not virtuous karma and so with regard to the past and future lives so there are two things we animate and inanimate objects so those who are in uh, those who those who are animate have experience of pain and pleasure whereas, whereas Without these experiences, they are inanimate. So if you look at the flowers and like sunflower and uh, so forth, so they kind of move according to the uh, called face the direction of the sun in the morning to the they face that these flowers face the east and then as the sun moves, it moves. And there is one uh, grass which is called touch me not, I think. If you touch it, it just shrinks it, uh, in Mysore or somewhere. There was one person named Kuncho Samden. He told me that it's called the Ngotseta or Tsa, uh, which uh, shows that it's sh uh, shy. And in America somewhere, there is something like a uh, <laughs> uh, thorn, and when people go quite close to it, it just shoots forth. The plant kind of shoots there. So if we are not careful and not uh, able to shirk that, I mean, it's quite, uh, it could be quite terrible. And so generally, there are two types, animate and in, inanimate in objects, animate sentient beings and inanimate objects. So the things come from causes and conditions, within the causes, substantial causes and uh, cooperative conditions are there. The cooperative, uh, the, the substantial cause refers to those which uh, actually uh, turn into the result or the effect, the causes. But when it comes to the subtle particles of our bodies or the external objects, they are same. So. After what kind of uh, conglomeration of those uh, uh, particles uh, do they actually become some support of life or not? We should really check. Uh, it's something the scientists could uh, check. So even the inanimate objects have to come from a similar cause that can give rise to it, them. And also our body, when we, if we trace the, the, the origin, I mean, the, we can see that it started with Big Bang, the Big Bang, that in turn, which in turn could happen because of causes and conditions. And the explosion at Big Bang could also happen because of the energy and uh, b th th those energies should come in the substantial course. We c you should try to be able to try, uh, trace them in previous. 
um, particles. And therefore, if we go on like this, tracing the origin, it's uh, we can we could uh, say that it's beginningless. Otherwise, if you say there's a beginning, that's the beginning. Then you would have to say uh, some incompatible cause, like a permanent, unchanging cause, gives rise to this. <laughs> so within sentient beings, we have consciousness or mind, which is not material, doesn't have shape or color. It's mere experience and awareness has this quality of being awareness and uh, a clarity or luminosity. And therefore, regarding its course, there could be cooperating conditions, like when we have uh, the eye consciousness and uh, ear consciousness and so forth, there are these organs which also serve. Whereas the mind or the consciousness itself, for example, at the time of conception in a mother's womb, because it has its own substantial cause, you should have, um, we, we could only point to a previous moment of consciousness. As the Dhammakirti says, uh, something which is not consciousness cannot be a substantial cause of consciousness. So the cause also has to be some uh, uh, similar in nature. So I was one uh, recently in Nasik, near Nasik. I know one uh, Hindu Swamiji. He is a learned uh, Swamiji, and he even is familiar with uh, the Mula uh, Karika by Nagarjuna. And Samdhan Rambuchi also I took uh, with me, <laughs> and I asked him. What is the reason to, uh, that we uh, have the three planes of existence, desire ram, form ram, and formless rams? And then I asked him about um, past and future life. How do we prove that? And he said, because we have memory. So amongst his students, uh, he said, there is one person who uh, has very clear memory of uh, past life. And so um, he said that the, the memory could be used to prove that there is a previous, previous life. And also uh, in the 400 verses of Nag uh, Arya Deva, uh, the same thing is said. So if you are, un if you look at the teaching of the un uh, teaching of the Buddha in an unbiased manner, then you will see that there's at least something that we can think about. It makes sense. <laughs> Even amongst uh, between two uh, 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 twin of the uh, there is no uh, same thought process going on in the two persons. Of course, because of the biology itself, the physical, uh, biologically, of course, we may uh, be able to see differences in people. But I have a scientist uh, friend, he's no more with us, he said there are 60 bil 6 billion people on Earth, and he said the neurons of each and every one of the 6 billion are different, the structure of the neuron, and therefore there is the, the different uh, difference in our thoughts. So when it comes to the subtle particles, of course, there are differences. <laughs> but when we talk about whether, whether people have luck or not, we do say it's because of good luck or bad luck that we have. But this alone cannot explain everything. So sometimes uh, we find that things are almost like accident. But there are other factors. So I've asked scientists when a two perfect semen, uh, a perfect semen and a perfect ovum get together, is it sure that uh, conception will take place? They said no. So a perfect, un uh, without any defect, a sperm and the mother's womb, without a perfect mother's womb and a mother's ovum, 
even if these three th these causes are there, it's not certain or sure that a conception will happen, and therefore there should be a third course. According to science, of course, they are not, they will not they are not able to uh, posit that third course yet. <laughs> but for us, we we can think about the bardo being who would conceive in the mother's womb. And therefore, there's more reason for past and future life. If you um, to assert that there is no past and future lives, I mean, the, the ultimate reason that you, uh, people will may give is because I don't see them. But that's not a good reason, because if you were pressed, if, there, if something exists, it is, is it necessary that you should see it? Of course not. And though it's very difficult to hold up this, uh, to this position, <laughs> so, so far, what scientists have not found is uh, only the case that they have not seen them or found them or discovered them. It's not the case that they have found the, the, uh, the, what they have not found to be non-existent. So it is said uh, in our text that while we are uh, uh, at night time, uh, the, the continent, northern continent of Kuru, is uh, it's time of sunshine there. So it's almost like pointing to America, but that's not the case because uh, the people of the uh, Kuru region, continent, are said to live for a hundred uh, a thousand years. And then, with regard to Mount Meru, of course, it's, it goes against reason. <laughs> And when we deal with the um, logic of non-observance in the Pramanavartika, there are two types. One is if something uh, is perceptible but it's not perceived, then I mean. Uh, if uh, something uh, should be perceptible but not perceived, it cannot uh, be perceived. And so this is the logic that we can use to disprove the existence of Mount Meru, because it's supposed to be existent, but we cannot see or find it, uh, observe it. Whereas, with regard to the size and the distance of the moon and the sun from the earth, there's huge difference between what is taught in the classical texts and also what is taught, uh, um, what, what the scientists find today. So in the classical text, it is said that the height of the moon and the sun from the earth is, I mean, the, uh, regarding this, it is said that the sun and the moon go around the Mount Meru, uh, around the uh, halfway uh, of uh, the height of the uh, Mount Meru. And then with regard to the size, it mentions only the difference uh, of uh, one league or yojana between sun and moon in size. And this cannot be as, uh, uh, accepted today because it goes against our empirical uh, experience. So we need to still think about uh, the uh, rams, uh, the godly rams and so forth, uh, which are said to be on the Mount Meru and so forth. And uh, then regarding the lifespan of people, human beings on this earth, it is said that in the beginning it used to be uh, inconceivable and, so, uh, and then there's a decrease in the lifespan. So perhaps it should also be interpreted unless we can explain uh, that they had a, a different biological, I mean, a physical body than the we have. 
So, with regard to the lifespan of the people on Earth, it's also said that it decreased to 6,000, uh, 60,000, 20,000, and so forth. I mean, 80,000, uh, 20,000, and so forth, which we have to rethink. We are reading from page number 326. The text liberation in the palm of your hand. Uh, the text is will be released uh, edition. We are held out here. People born in this hell are sentient beings. We have taken rebirth here under the power of evil karma. When these sentient beings see others, they immediately get angry. Anything they pick up turns into a weapon. They keep hacking each other to pieces, all faint and collapse on the ground. Then a voice from the sky tells them, you will now be revived. A cool wind strikes their bodies a contributory factor for the scattered flesh and bones to come together. Their bodies heal and become as they are before. Then they do the same thing again. Every day they fall into these dead faints. Every day there are many hundreds of these deaths and they are revived many hundreds of times. We must develop insight into what it would be like to be born there now, to be hacked by weapons, to faint, to be revived, and so forth. In this life, we are afraid to be stabbed by a small knife and die the once, and we still suffer inconceivable terror and pain. In this hell, we will die many times each day and would experience this each time. Is there a fan? It would be nice to have a fan at the back side. Continue reading from page number 327. In this hell, we would die many times each day and would experience this each time. In our lifespans, there will be also be very long. Our former human lives would bear no comparison. Nagarjuna said in his letter, is be too cold on this side, so the other side, please on. Actually, sorry, I'm uh, two pages ahead. His Holiness is reading from page number 325. 
The hell of continued resurrection is 32,000 yojanas under Bodh Gaya in India. So this statement is actually something that we need to investigate. According to this text, if we measure it, I think we will reach America directly. We're reading from page number 325, the last para. The other hotels are below this hell, with 4,000 yojanas between each, each of them. All the ground and all the mountains in these hells are composed entirely of red hot, intense burning iron, the ground like that in the human realms, and not at all flat, not at all like the palm of your hand. When you are about to be born into hot hells, as Gunda Rinpoche says, human life is impermanent, a short bout of sleep, crowded with meaningless dreams, some happy, some sad. When you suddenly awaken to a life in the pit of law realms, what will you do? That is at the point of death, you have hallucinations of being cold, so you develop a craving for heat, which activates karma, leading to rebirth in hot hells. You die, this is like falling asleep. You experience the bardo as you would a dream. Then you certainly find yourself in the hot hells, which is like waking up. Hellfire is seven times hotter than fire in the human realms. Let us compare these two types of fire. Human fire is so cold compared to hellfire that it is like water cooled by Goshirsha central wood. So the suffering of the hot hells in general are quite unbearable. The suffering of having a body, the thing being burnt, that is enormous. The suffering of having flesh with as little tolerance as a newborn child's. The suffering that the whole suffering that the thing doing the burning, the fire is extremely hot and so on. There are eight such hot hells. There are no hell gods here. People born in this hell are sentient beings. We have taken rebirth here under the power of evil karma. We have already read this page. Turning to page number 327, the last para. The assemble and be crushed hell. Be crushed hell. Rebirth here is usually the ripening of killing. Two mountains resembling, say, goats or rams had heads raised together and you are crushed between them. There is no avenue of escape. The two mountains separate and your body regenerates to its former state. The process is repeated again and again. Some beings are ground to powder between green stones. Some are pounded with pestles like sesame seeds. Some are squids in iron vices. You could be crushed or whatever between many different instruments. This take the form of whatever killing instrument you used in the past. Suppose you kill a loose between your fingernails. Later in hell, you will be killed by being crushed between two mountains that look like fingernails. The hell of lamentation. You are placed inside a house, house of burning iron. It has no doors and it is all on fire, inside and out. You suffer, thinking, I will not find any means of escape. Your great mental suffering makes you wail. The hell of great lamentation. You are placed in an iron house which is contained within another, each similar to the one above. Your suffering is also twice as great. You think I may escape from one of these iron horses, iron houses, but not from the other, and so you suffer, committing the ten non virtues or recklessly drinking alcohol can cause rebirth in these hells. A sutra tells us much the same thing. Drink alcohol and you will be born in a place of lamentation. People who serve are born in its surrounding hell. The hotel, you are impelled on a flaming iron skiver that runs through your anus and emerges out of the top of your head. All your insides burn and you burn through roaring flames issuing from your mouth, eyes and so forth. You are cooked in huge copper cauldron of boiling water. Then your bones are reassembled, your body is restored to its former condition, and you are cooked all over again. The extremely hot hell, we're reading from page number 329. 
the second para, the hell without respite. In this hell, there is no chance to rest, and so the suffering here is greater than in all the Ebu hotels. When we burn rocks or iron in a fire, they become indistinguishable from the fire. The bodies of being born in this hell are similarly indistinguishable from the fire. One can tell that there are sentient beings in this hell only by the pathetic sounds they make. They are burned by eleven fires, the fires in the four cardinal points of compass, the four in the sub-points, the fire in the zenith and nadir, and the fire within the own bodies. They are like the charred wick in an offering lamp. Their suffering is limitless. Mm. Uh, reading from page number 331, the second para. Once reborn here, we must experience suffering until the results of the evil karma run out, for we will not be able to detach our consciousness from our bodies. Nagarjuna's letter tells us such sufferings are utterly intolerable. One will experience them billions of times. So long as the non-virtue has not run out, one will not stop living that life. The lives spent in the eight hotels are very long. The shortest life spans are those of being in the hell of continual resurrection. Fifty of our human years constitute one day for the gods in the realm of four Maharajas. Thirty of these days are reckoned to be one of their months, twelve of these months one of their years. Five hundred of these years make a lifetime for being in the realm of four Maharajas, yet there is only a day in the hell of continual resurrection. Thirty of these days are reckoned to be a month in this hell, twelve such months make a year. A lifetime in the hell of continual resurrection is five hundred of these years, one could say this is 1.62 trillion human years. The old woodblock edition of Manjushri's own words states that it is sixty billion years, but this is a printer's error. You should consult either the Meru Monastery Woodblock Masters of this text or Lamrims of Southern Lineage. Reading from page number 333, the last para, thinking about the sufferings of the cold hells. The cold hells are on a level with the hot hells and lie to the north, which is why this land of ours is very cold. The cold hells are separated from each other vertically by 2,000 yojanas. You may be wondering, in that case, the cold hells could not be on a level with the hot hells because the hot hells are separated from each other vertically by 4,000 yojanas. There may be 4,000 yojanas between each ground surface of the hot hells, but each of the cold hells has snow-covered mountains that are 2,000 yojanas high, so the cold hells are in fact level with the hot hells. When about to be born there, you desire cold bodily sensations at the point of death. This activates the karma to be reborn in the cold hells. You experience the bardo as if it were a dream. You are then reborn in the cold hells, which is like waking up. There are snow-covered mountains in these places, each many yojanas high. There is no light from sun, moon, fire, and so forth. It is so dark that you cannot see the moments of your own arms. The ground below is a glacier, a blizzard reaches on high, between these two a cold wind blows. There is no means of keeping warm, so no fire, no sun, no clothes, nothing. There are eight such cold hells, each one progressively colder. There is the hell of blisters, where you develop blisters on the day.
Now we are reading from page number 335, thinking about the sufferings of the occasional has. As Maitri has said in the prayer, that may the sufferings of the sufferings of the lower realms be extinguished, and they may they all attain higher realms. So for someone who do not have any idea about the higher paths and the higher realms, it is a different case. But for other people, I think the best way to uh, best way to stop being uh, reborn in the law of realms is by practicing compassion and meditating on bodhicitta and also the wisdom realizing emptiness. And I think that meditating on bodhicitta and so on is something that if we uh, make if we cultivate is something that you can develop and you can generate within yourself. Continuous reading from page number 335, the final para, thinking about the sufferings of the occasional hells. These hells are in the human realms, on the ocean shore, and so forth. At one time, some merchants invited Arya Shandarachita to accompany them to an island. He struggled behind the others and walked to the ocean shore where there was a beautiful temple, the 500 members of the Sangha, they invited him inside. The monks quarreled at noon, but when noon passed, everything returned to normal. He asked for the cause and was told that it was the result of their not being friendly to each other at the noonday meal and fighting in the past when the teachings of Buddha Kashyapa were still in existence. The Arya also saw hell beings in the form of walls, pillars, pestles, robes, brooms, water pipes, and cooking pots. Later, when Arya returned from his journey, he asked Shakyamuni about all this. We have already dealt with Buddha's reply concerning the pillar-like beings in the section on the preparatory rites. The pestle-like creature, however, had been a monk in the time of Buddha Kashaba's teachings and had lost his temper and said to a novice, you ought to be pounded like a pestle. The monk had become the pestle-like creature as a result of these insulting words. Kevja Pabonga Rinpoche told how these beings had been experienced these things from the time of the teaching of Buddha Kashaba till the present. Once there was a sheep's captain named Kodikarna who had been born with an airing set with a gem for 10 million gold pieces. Captain Kodikarna had sailed away to obtain jewels. He fell asleep by the ocean shore and other merchants went on without him. He awoke to find that a strong wind had erased the path and even his packed animal, a donkey, could not pick up the scent. Kodikarna wandered around, unable to find the path there is a house like a palace, and in it a man is surrounded by four goddesses. The captain saw that at night the man had such bliss, it was like that of the gods. But by day the house began burning, iron licked by fire. The women turned into four ferocious dogs. The man fell down on his face, and the dogs ate his flesh bit by bit. Then after the sun had gone down, things reverted to their former state. He asked the man what the cause was. The man said he used to be a butcher in the town of Stara, but on the advice of Arya Katyayana, he had taken vows not to kill at night. He had not been able to take these vows for the daytime, and this was the result. The man said he had a son in Stara who was a butcher. Kotikana was to give the son a message, you should not kill when you give alms to Arya Katayana, you should dedicate the good virtues to me. As proof, the man told Kotikana he had hidden a pot of gold in the place where the swords were kept. Kotikana moved on, there was a fine house where men and two beautiful women enjoyed the peak of happiness and bliss. But the captain saw it was quite the opposite at night, when the women turn into snakes and are at the man, starting from the top of his head. Kotikarna asked the man why this was. The man said that when he was a Brahmin in Stara, he used to be an adulter adulterer, but he took the vow from Katayana not to do this during the daytime. This was the result. He said, go and talk with the son I have in Stara, and give Kotikarna a similar message to the previous one to take back. And as proof, he told Kotikarna he had hidden a pot full of gold under the stove. 
Then the captain moved on further and saw a four-legged form, a hungry ghost held of each leg. And Captain Pamanga Rumbuchi told the rest of this story. Reading from page number 338, the last para, thinking about the sufferings of the hungry ghosts. Manjushri's own words discusses animals first. Hungry ghosts have greater wisdom than animals, so are higher. If one way to teach dharma to some hungry ghosts, they could understand it. Animals are dull and stupid. It is an inferior rebirth and a bigger hindrance to practicing dharma than being a hungry ghost. So the sufferings of animals are taught first. However, the swift path puts hungry ghosts first. Generally, they have greater suffering than animals. There are two subsections at this point, thinking of the general suffering of hungry ghosts under six headings, heat, cold, hunger, thirst, exhaustion, and fear, and thinking of the sufferings of particular types of hungry ghosts. Think as follows, at present I have not been uh, reborn in hell, but if I were born a hungry ghost, I would be so tormented by intolerable sufferings, heat, cold, hunger, thirst, exhaustion and fear, that I would not even be able to recollect that I should practice dharma, let alone actually practice it. I have not taken such a rebirth, owing to the kindness of my gurus, what great merit I have to be able to meditate even perfunctorily on the Dharma of Lamrim. How lucky I have been. But we have accumulated, accumulated in our mental streams much karma that will throw us into these rebirths. This karma is still powerful and undegenerated. We know it is beyond our present capacity to purify it all before we die. There is more though. Usually our thoughts at the time of death are crucial. Sinners may have committed great sins during his life, but if they die with only virtuous thoughts on their minds, they will activate virtuous karma from a past life. If Dharma practitioners are angry, for example, at the point of death, their non-virtuous karma will be activated. Normally, the thoughts with which one has the greatest familiarity in this life will be the ones that manifest at the point of death. We have always had the strongest familiarity with delusions, the three poisons, so our non virtuous karma is sure to be activated at death. One may be revolted by food and drink at death and feel, may I never hear the word food again. This would trigger off karma to be reborn as a hungry ghost by either attachment or hostility. You cannot be sure that you will not be reborn in the unfortunate state of a hungry ghost. In fact, most of us will be reborn as one. The Hungry Ghost rebirths are located in Kabila Nagara, the city of Hungry Ghost, which is more than 500 yojanas underground. This place has absolutely no grass, trees, or water. The whole ground is copper slack, as if scorched by the sun. The bodies and limbs of Hungry Ghosts are more ungainly, their hair is matted on their large heads, their face is wrinkled, and their necks extremely thin and unable to support their heads. Reading from page number 340, they have huge mountain-like bodies and an uneven number of legs and arms, which are as thin as stalls and unable to support them. They have a hundred times more difficulty in walking than old people do in our human realm. For many years they have found nothing to drink, so there is absolutely no moisture in their bodies, no blood, pus and so forth. Their muscles and veins are wrapped in their dry skin like a dry log wrapped in brown leather. When they move about, the joints in their arms and legs creak like dry wood or like two rocks tapping together, giving off sparks. 
Since goats have had no food or drink for hundreds or thousands of years, they have enormous suffering. On top of this, there isn't a place where they haven't been in search of food and drink. Their bodies are feeble, so they are exhausted. They are in terror of seeing Yamasujana, the king of the city of hungry goats, fearing for their lives. In the heat of summer, moonlight burns them, and sunlight makes them cold in the winter, so they have great suffering. Thinking about the sufferings of particular types of hungry ghosts, this has three parts. The ghosts with external obscurations. These hungry ghosts see water, trees laden with food and so forth, for which they rarely trudge long distances, but when they get there, the things vanish. When some hungry ghosts reach them, the hungry ghosts are prevented from enjoying them by armed men st standing guard, in addition to their sufferings of hunger and thirst. Therefore, they also experience inconceivable suffering due to physical exhaustion and mental depression. Those with internal obscurations. These hungry ghosts occasionally obtain food, but it does not get past their mouths. Their necks have notes in them that make swallowing food very difficult. Some ghosts have to drink rancid pus from their own quarters, as it says in the full version of the above mentioned story about Kotekarna. The food they ate takes various forms corresponding to different types of karma the ghosts have accumulated, burning pieces of iron, grain husks, pus or blood, their own flesh, and so forth. The ghosts must endure these unbearable karmic results according to whatever is their accumulated karma. Food and drink may go down some hungry ghost's neck, but it turns into boiling iron when it reaches the stomach, which, as well as not slacking their thirst, creates a limitless suffering. There is one type of hungry ghost that this sort of thing does not happen to, but their stomachs are so huge that the food doesn't fill them. Sheets of flame, the fires of hunger, come out of the mouths of some of these hungry ghosts. This will o the whips is merely fire from the mouths of such ghosts. Continuously reading from page number 341, the second para. Those with obstructions from notes. Once in, when Ananda was going about his daily business, he saw a female hungry ghost. She had three notes in her neck, and she shouted the five kinds of terrifying words. Hungry ghosts of this type have a vertical row of three notes in their necks, which causes them infinite suffering. His Holiness was commenting about the order of the presentation of the animal realms and hungry ghosts. Uh, His Holiness was commenting that in Lamrim Chemo, the animal realm chapter is uh, written first. However, to the liberation of the palm of hand, it's later. Continue with reading, those with obscurations from notes. Once when Ananda was going about his daily business, he saw a female hungry ghost. She had three notes in her neck, and she shouted five kinds of terrifying words. Hungry ghosts of this type has, have a vertical row of three notes in their necks, which causes them infinite suffering. Nagarjuna's letter says, Hungry ghosts are also bereft of the things they desire. This gives rise to continual suffering, aggravated by most intolerable hunger, thirst, cold, heat, fatigue, and fear. Some have mouths as small as the eye of a needle, yet their stomachs the size of mountains are plagued by hunger, but lack the power to digest the smallest speck of food. Some go naked, through their bodies are but skin and bone, they are as thin as palm trees, some are aflame at sex and mouth, food put into their mouths is burnt. Most cannot often even fill for food, no pus, feces, blood, and so on. They touch their faces together and take rented pus from the quarters at their throat. Reading from page number 342. For hungry ghosts, in the two hottest months of summer, even moonlight is hot, the sun cold in winter, and trees become fruitless. And at the time of uh, death, 
It's very important generally to have a good motivation and uh, thinking about one's own uh, motivation. So even if you are not able to shift and have such a good motivation generally, but at the time of dying, it's very important to shift the motivation. It can be done also by uh, some of your friends who can whisper the virtuous words into their ears. Continues the reading from uh, page number 342. Chandra Gomin's letter to a disciple says, Unending thirst, if they see afar a clear stream and wish to drink from it, they go there. Yet the water is mixed with old hairs, fish gills, and rank pus. The water is full of mud, blood, and feces. A wind waves of waves and the spray is mountain big cold. When they go to the green sandalwood forest of Malabar, this become burning woods are filled of sharp tipped flames. Many burning fragments drop and gorge them with poles. Even when they go to a lake, it's terrifying waves. With dazzling form at the crest, the water turns into a mirage of desert sands, a tormenting place with sandstorms swept by fierce hot winds. When the launch for thick storm clouds gather, they rain a fog of impairing iron debats upon them. Flinty diamond nuggets of golden color and orange lighting chains rain upon their bodies. While they are tormented by the heat, even sleep to them seems hot. When made pathetic by wind, even fire makes them cold. The intolerable ripening effects of karma completely blind them. They have various utterly mistaken hallucinations. Their mouths are as small as the eye of a needle, their terrifying stomachs and many yojanas round. Very dispathetic creatures to drink. Even the water of great oceans could not go down their cavernous gullets. These poisonous mouths would dry the water to the last drop. Kesang Gyasu, the seventh Dalai Lama, said similarly, stomachs like mountains, necks blocked, limbs as thin as grass, dry bodies covered in dust, joints give up sparks, their mirrors glance dry up rivers, always weary, tormented by hunger, may a shower of food, drink and nectar rain down upon these hungry ghosts. We can't be sure that this time, next year, we won't be reborn as one of these hungry ghosts. The causes for such a rebirth are being miserly with one's possessions, enormous covetousness, such great attachment to one's possession that one fondles them over and over again, preventing other people from practicing generosity, stealing from people's possessions, stealing, stealing offerings made to Sangha, abusing charity, and other forms of taking what is not given to you. Another cause is calling people hungry ghosts, and especially if you call a member of Sangha a hungry ghost, you will take rebirth as one yourself 500 times. When hungry ghosts of the type with obscurations from notes receive a drop of water, it is due to their not having been miserly about giving water. In the past, the others do not have the fortune to enjoy any water. Acharya Bodhijana went to the realm of hungry ghosts. An extremely pathetic ghost with 500 children gave the Acharya a message to take back to her husband when the Acharya returned to the human realms. Twelve years ago, she said, my husband left to search for food, and I have meanwhile given birth to 500 children. I have not had so much as a drop of water, and so I have undergone great hardship and suffering. Ajarya, tell my husband to help me by returning quickly from the human realms with any food he has found. The Acharya said, what if there are many hungry ghosts there? I won't know which to your husband. He has some identifying marks that set him apart from other hungry ghosts. He has lost one eye and one of his limbs is deformed. When the Acharya returned to the human realms, he saw some hungry ghosts. One of them was just like the ghost to whom he was to give the message. 
the Acharya told his story and gave the message. The hungry ghost said, I've gone such a distance, but in 12 years, all I found was this food. He was holding a small piece of dry spittle with the claws of his clenched fist. This was his most prized possession. A monk who maintained his ethics spat this out and dedicated it. Many hungry ghosts fought for it, and I won. Unless we are careful, we can never be sure there won't come a time when we will have to make lunch out of dry, dry foods. We are reading from page number 345. 25 years after the mother of the novice monk Uthara died, he saw a terrifying hungry ghost. The frightened Uthara was about to flee in terror when the ghost said, Don't run away. Who are you? Uthara asked and he replied, My only son, I'm your loving mother, from whom you were born, reborn among the hungry ghosts who have no food or drink. Twenty-five years have passed since the time of my death. I have not seen any water. Where will I see anything like food? The novice asked Buddha to dedicate prayers to her. Buddha used his skillful means, and when the ghost left that rebirth, she was reborn as a hungry ghost called Mardika, who was extremely rich. Her, mis her miserliness was six times worse than before, and she would not practice generosity. The novice persuaded her to offer Buddha a bolt of cloth, but she regretted the action and she stole it back. According to the story, this happened many times. Kyabjapabha Warambrachi told the story of a monk who had a beautiful saffron robe. He became so attached to it that after his death he was reborn as hungry ghost wearing a saffron robe. These days, miserly people are praised as being clever, but miserliness especially is the cause for being born as a hungry ghost. We act in a miserly way, so it is almost certain we will be reborn as hungry ghosts next year, or at most in 40 or 50 years' time, that is if we do not get rebirth in hell. Reading from page number 346, thinking about the sufferings of the animals, this is two sections, thinking about the general sufferings and thinking about the sufferings of particular types of animals. Animals experience five kinds of suffering, eating one another, being stupid and benighted, experience heat and cold, experiencing hunger and thirst and being exploited or made to work. The sufferings of animals are the least of the three law realms, yet in such rebirths they eat one another and suffer. Animals with huge bodies, sea monsters and the like, have bodies many yojanas long. Some sea monsters are types of fish, others are whales that are capable of swallowing them, and there are even whales that can swallow other whales. Many smaller animals infest the bodies of the monster and eat them. There comes a point when the monster can no longer bear this, and they wrap their bodies on rocky mountains. This kills the parasites living on their bodies, and the oceans are made red for many yojanas. The larger creatures devour the smaller ones, while many smaller ones feed on the larger ones. Though they cannot bear to remain there, they cannot even wiggle free of the spot they live on. The animals of the great oceans are heaped on top of each other and must live with one eating the other from the behind. Creatures reborn in the dark depths of the oceans between the continents do not recognize each other. Mothers do not recognize their offsprings just after giving birth, and vice versa. They eat whatever falls into their mouths, and so must live by feeding on each other. Even the animals in the human realms eat each other, house eat little birds, birds eat worms, bees of prey and deer kills each other, hunting dogs stalk deer and kill them, and so on. So we will stop here. It's almost 11.30.
Thanksgiving mantle offering. 